report. My name is Janet O, and I am the Assistant Curator of Contemporary Art and Programs here at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, before we start, I'd first like to acknowledge that we are in the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatish Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. <clears throat> As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland, and we wish to pay our respects. Um, I just want to start by giving a little bit of background on the Global Art Dialogues and how it came to be. The program started during shelter in place, so earlier part of 2020, um, as a key component of the museum's contemporary art engagement efforts. And through this conversation series, we've really been able to reach people as far as Thailand and different parts of Asia by running virtually. Um, <clears throat> while seeking to um, intersect with works on view here at the Asian Art Museum. Um, so in a way, it's been locally and globally connected at the same time. So it's been a while since we've had a global art dialogue and we were able to provide it with this um, stellar group of artists and educators and curators that you'll hear from very shortly. Um, I should also mention that it's connected to the platform After Hope that is, has been on view since last year here at the Asian Art Museum um, as a way to connect and really broaden our reach. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanna introduce Kathy Zarur who will be moderating today's discussion. Kathy is a curator and an associate professor of art history at Skyline College in San Bruno, California. Zarur's exhibitions consider topics that relate, relate to land and place, such as belonging, ingenuity, diaspora, migration and alliance building. So I will hand it over to Kathy. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Um, hello, and thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, before I start, I'd just like to thank the Asian Art Museum for hosting this program and to Abby Chen for her visionary ideas, including the Global Art Dialogues, and especially Janet O oh for her wonderful collaboration and support um, as we've worked on this project together. So when Janet and I began planning this Global Art Dialogue, I was interested in exploring what we eventually termed expanding definitions of Asia. And two things informed my focus at that time, my study and teaching of historical Asian art, as well as events in the diasporic context. So I was thinking about ancient exchanges of ideas and forms in Asia through well-studied phenomena, such as the Silk Route or the spread of Buddhism and Islam. But at the same time, I was preoccupied with things happening in the here and now. For example, or in particular, the strong response to stop anti-Asian violence, the uprising in support of Black Lives, and kind of, just bear with me, the increasing use of the term West Asia in place of the, of the Eurocentric and colonial era term Middle East. So in short, I was thinking about the challenges and the opportunities of coalition building among disparate communities and how we might highlight common experiences despite the differences to further some of our common goals. Of course, ideas often morph when they're applied. So when Janet and I began to make a list of artists whose work we love, uh, things shifted. <laughs> In the work of the three artists that we're going to hear from today, we won't necessarily deal directly with the topics that were on my mind when Janet and I first started collaborating. Um, but there are some common themes and practices in their work that could shed light on what it means to be coalition minded. So before we begin our discussion, which is really going to be just a panel, um, where I'll ask questions of the three artists. I'd like to briefly introduce each of them. Um, Janet, if you don't mind, could we also put uh, their websites in the chat so that uh, audience members could look them up later? So here, here are the short intros. Zena Barake is a Bay Area-based artist. Her work deconstructs war 
and is rooted in her experience of growing up in Beirut, Lebanon during conflict. She, part she participates regularly in exhibitions and film festivals in the US and internationally. Her recent work, which we'll learn about today, has been featured on Day for Night, which is Jim Campbell's Salesforce Tower Top electronic sculpture. Her video, Scenarios of Breaking Down a Wall, is currently on view at the exhibition After Hope at the Asian Art Museum. Welcome, Zena. <laughs> Asma Kazmi is a research-based artist and an assistant professor in art practice and at the Berkeley Center for New Media at UC Berkeley. Through long-term engagements with cities and materials, Cosme tells intertwining stories about Islam, Muslim culture, complex trade routes, global flows of people and commodities, labor, colonial and indigenous knowledge systems, and interspecies entanglements, which is very exciting. <laughs> Maya Cruz Paleleo is a multidisciplinary Brooklyn-based artist. Migration and the permeable concept of home are constant themes in their paintings, installations, sculptures, and drawings. Influenced by familial oral histories about migrating to the US from the Philippines, and the troubling colonial history between these countries, Paleleo infuses these narratives with both memory and imagination. So without further ado, welcome to the artist. I'm so excited to be here with you all. Um, I'm just gonna get started with the first question. Um, okay. So each of you brings, excuse me. Each of you brings historical visual forms into your artworks. For example, Asma, you refer to the 17th century Mughal Emperor Jahangir in one of your self-portraits. Maya, you bring an aspect of a 7th century BCE urn from the Philippines called the Manungul Jar into your paintings. And Zena, in a recent animation, you reference ancient Assyrian sculpture. So as an art historian and a curator, I'm very interested in your engagement with historical visual culture, because in doing so, you, your work collapses time and space to bring the contemporary moment into conversation with aspects of the ancient world. So I'd love if you could, uh, if you, all three of you could talk about this, um, perhaps address how it became a strategy and what it enables and maybe we can start with Asma. Um, thank you so much, Kathy um, and Abby Chen and Janet Oh um, for inviting me and for organizing this. Um, um, Kathy, thank you for your question. Um, you know, in, in, in order for me to think about this idea that you're referencing of collapsing space and time, um, I, I'd like to use um, a specific example of my work, as you referenced, um, where I, um, which is instigated by an image of, uh, or a gesture of the Mughal Emperor Jahangir. Um, and um, in this project, I repeat this gesture um, to create an interaction between multiple locations and times. Um, in order for us to learn something about um, the present moment and in specific um, about how we re relate to materials. Um, so um, it, just a little bit of history about Jahangir. Jahangir was a Mughal emperor who lived in the uh, late 15 and early 1600s um, in India. Um, and he was a collector. Uh, he was given the name World Caesar. Um, and this image that you see here on the left um, shows him um, holding a globe in his hand um, as the World Caesar. But he was a collector of all kinds of strange things uh, and, and non-strange things like animals and plants, minerals, uh, weapons, um, textiles. Uh, Jahangir often um, 
commissioned portraits where he would hold an object um, that he valued in his arm, um, lifted up to his face um, and gazing um, at, this port at this object. So I've been fascinated by this gesture, um, um, it, which reads to me as a kind of embodied um, enchantment with the material world. Um, you know, I've been thinking about this as, um, as, as a question, you know, what kind of scientist or emperor in this case poses over and over again uh, with an object. Um, what, um, what is Jahangir thinking about um, um, the, the thing that he's um, meditating on? Um, and you know, what are his experiences with, um, with matter and the material world? And so the, these questions led me to um, a workshop that I did with some students in, at Habib University in Karachi last year. Um, where we um, studied Mughal Islamic miniature painting, but we also made lists of all of our personal possessions. Um, and um, you can advance to the next image, Kathy, um, or whoever's doing it. Um, and, um, and, and so we posed with um, some of these objects that students brought in from their home. Um, uh, in in Jahangir's pose, in order for us to, um, to think playfully but critically about consumerism um, and our excessive consumption uh, of things like plastics and electronics, uh, which we held in our um, palms and uh, posed with. So just to wrap up my, my answer, I don't wanna take up too much time. Um, you know, this project uh, uh, for me, um, it represents looking at the past, looking at Jahangir, uh, but also thinking of it in a critical way um, it, where we're borrowing from something from this kind of Islamic um, ecological and material awareness. Um, but, you know, I, as I spoke to the students, we're also mindful that Jahangir's portraits are a kind of projection of power. They're hierarchical, uh, they're patriarchal. Um, so, so, you know, in order, so, so the part of the idea of the project was to create a kind of intervention um, using this gesture of holding and the gaze um, with seemingly mundane objects to, um, to not depict them as property, but rather to cultivate a kind of complex engagement with everyday objects. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Asma. I love this work so much. Um, Zena, would you like to go next? Uh, yes, sure. And uh, I too want to thank you, Kathy and Janet uh, and Abby, and for including me in this panel. Um, and um, I'm very happy to be in conversation also with Asma and Maya. Um, so for for what I want to talk about with this work, uh, it's it's called Standard of Capital, and it's screened on the Salesforce Tower. So thinking about this question of history, I think for me. Uh, this work, when I conceived it, it engages with history on two levels. Um, so the first one, uh, actually, uh, the source inspiration for this work is a Sumerian tablet called the Standard of Ur. Um, uh, maybe, please, if we can just uh, jump to the next slide, just because I'm just going to talk about this. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so this is what you see on the side. It's uh, a Sumerian tablet, Standard of Ur. Um, and uh, it has two sides, the war panel and the peace panel. And I was intrigued by it and I was thinking about it for like many years. And then it made sense for me for this work. Um, so I named the work, it's called Standard of Capital after this work. And uh, what, what I, the way it engages with history is that, as you said, Kathy, it collapses different time periods together because it's Mesopotamian art, so we're talking about something Asian. But at the same time, that Sumerian tablet was excavated by uh, Sir Leonard Woolley um, under mandatory Iraq, in, and that was in 1927 or 28. 
And he was commissioned by the British uh, Museum, uh, where this tablet is currently um, collected. And, and he was also commissioned by the University of Pennsylvania to do these ex excavations. And um, that was his expertise, Meso Mesopotamian art. And he was also a uh, British intelligence officer, a British spy. So in that sense, the work starting from this tablet also references this time period under mandatory Iraq. But then at the same time, using Mesopotamian art uh, references um, directly Iraqi people and Iraq. And when we think about that, we think about um, the invasion of Iraq post 9-11. And this is sort of what I had in mind in terms of having this animation on the Salesforce Tower. Um, so on that level, you have three different uh, times, a comp contemporary moment when we're talking about uh, the global war on terrorism post 9-11. It also connects to that mandatory uh, Iraq period under British rule, uh, which was from 1921 until 1932. And then we're also going back to um, Mesopotamian art and Mesopotamia being the cradle of civilization. So that's on one level. And then on the other level, there is also the museum object that this work references. And, and, and what I wanted to do was to bring into, to sort of emphasize all these conversations about museum objects, that cultural treasures that are looted during wars and then they're used to populate Western uh, museums like especially under British and uh, French mandates. Um, so that was the idea. And I read in a recent article by in The Atlantic by Samuel Siegel um, that uh, the US Immigration and Customs Enforcement repatriated more than 1,200 artifacts between 2015, uh, sorry, 2008 and 2015. And in 2021, that number has risen to uh, 17,000 objects. So they're sort of returned back to Iraq. So, um, you know, this is, this is very much about this contemporary moment. So this is how sort of this particular work engages uh, with history. Um, but generally also all my work kind of goes back to uh, a colonial period, um, whether it's with my animations or other works. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Zena. Yeah, you bring up um, the topic of archives, museums, collecting um, slash looting, which is another um, another direction we could definitely go in this conversation. Uh, I think we could talk for a really long time, but we only have one hour. So um, I would love to hear from Maya on this question. Yeah, I would love to be on that. I would love to talk more about that too. <laughs> um, yeah, um, also thanks everybody for organizing this panel and for all of the people here for joining us. Um, it's so great to just uh, hear what um, what everybody's been talking about. And, you know, I was thinking about this um, question about these uh, these artifacts. And I think for me, um, you know, I I definitely think about the gap in um, in knowledge, I guess, or learning about my, our, you know, where my family comes from. And, you know, I know in the at the Met Museum, I know exactly where the Philippine objects are and I go to see them and they're like these burial things and there's like two of them. And um, so it's interesting to think like being in Western education um, painting, you know, I'm so saturated with the Western uh, canon and uh, paint what, you know, Western paintings. So for me, it was a really um, important uh, for me to kind of learn about this this um, this jar, this Manungol jar and um, and how it kind of resonated with some of the other themes that I had seen in, in other historical uh, art historical paintings um, that weren't necessarily from the Philippines. But, um, but yeah, I think that this is a painting that's on the screen that 
is sort of inspired by the the jar, the burial jar. Um, and that's my grandmother there sitting in the front of the boat and she's being ferried into the afterlife. And, um, you know, I think that incorporating um, my family and into, into my paintings sort of brings things into the present. And I think one of the things I think about a lot is like how much was lost in, in migration and, and in between the generations, you know, and I think, and also just of all the centuries of colonization and sort of this dysphoric feeling of, I, I don't know what, what, um, what our history is, uh, sort of feeling lost in that. So I think for me in painting and, and looking into um, these historical objects and also archival research is, is just a really, um, it's sort of a way to be in that space of, uh, even though it's complicated and the, the people who have, how these objects got in these collections is you know questionable and violent. I mean, that's, that's it, like that is our history. So um, I think that, um, yeah, those are, those are sort of the things that I was thinking about that those, those gaps and how, how bringing them into the work today, um, like you said, um, collapses time and space. And that's another thing that I think about a lot is this like idea of separation between, I guess, ancient, you know, the ancient things that we see in museums and that that's, it was interesting because when I was doing research in Chicago at the Field Museum, I was talking to one of the, um, the director there about the Philippine collection that they have there. And, and it was interesting because the older generation was sort of separated. They were like, that's not us. Those are, those are like the, I don't know, primitive people or something. And then the younger generation is coming to see, and there's this desire to learn more about it and to sort of own that. So um, yeah, I think there's an image of the jar that you can see um, in the next slide. And then just another example of like a Western art historical um, painting here at the Prado. And then the other one is in, in Manila. Yes, so, you know, Maya, I, I have a student in my Art of the Americas class who um, recently we looked at a double-headed bird textile made in Paracas in present-day Peru, and they were able to connect it to a textile with the same image from the Philippines, uh, thereby creating you know, this whole other, you know, Pacific world that is totally not represented in the canon. It's, it's, I was just flabbergasted and really, really excited um, by that. But yeah, the, the canon, you know, which artworks we know about, um, you know, particularly uh, people whose lands have been colonized or are in the process of being colonized that's yet another topic we could talk about. And we could probably link the two, <laughs> the looting and the um, canon. Um, it's intense. So thank you, Maya. Um, maybe we can go on to the next question. Let me look at the time, make sure we have enough time for audience questions as well. I've got a couple more questions for everybody. Um, so the next is um, to all three of you. Uh, would you agree with my reading that your work confronts power? And I define power in relation to empire, colonialism, and the state as it impacts people on both the domestic and international fronts. I'm thinking about this as it relates to the visual and conceptual strategies that you three employ. And these strategies include serious engagement with materials, the use of humor, making the art personal by bringing in references to family or using self-portraiture or performance. Um, I'm hoping that you three can talk about your strategies as ways to confront power. And I'm, I'm not even sure if the word confront is the right word. Um, so if you could just talk about how your strategies uh, engage with power. I would love that. Um, and perhaps we could again start with Asna. 
Um, thank you. Um, I, I think my image that I'm going to, the work that I'm going to talk about is right here. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I certainly think about confronting power, um, but perhaps um, I would like to think that it happens in a, in a subtle uh, way in my work in, in, in kind of these poetic hints um, and gestures. Um, and one way um, that I think about confronting power is to put the viewer in a, in a kind of productive um, discomfort. Um, and I'll, I'll speak about that um, just in a second. Um, so, uh, you know, for instance, this work um, that you see in front of you, it's called uh, Cranes and Cube. Um, and it was a virtual reality work uh, made in 2018. Um, and it's a recreation of the city of Mecca in Saudi Arabia, um, but from a kind of, um, uh, you know, ambivalent um, view that, um, that I have about that place. Um, so in my um, representation of uh, Mecca, um, it's a layered place um, where the past and the present can be simultaneously visualized as we were talking about earlier. Um, you see a black cube representing the Kaaba and, um, and then there are these um, objects that float around you. Um, I'm not showing a lot of images from this work. Um, but there are these sculptural objects. You see one example here. Um, and um, you see these hand-drawn construction cranes um, that um, are forming around um, the viewer as, as a kind of forest uh, of cranes. And the sound um, in the work um, is also of a, a construction site as well as um, uh, spaces uh, of um, where um, uh, religion or, you know, or Mecca particularly where um, there are these sounds connected to the Hajj pilgrimage. So this exaggerated space, it allows the viewer to reflect critically um, between the overlaps um, between religiosity, the market economy, um, and social inequality that are present um, in this in this sanctuary city, um, and I, I I name it as a sanctuary city, which it is. It's a historical sanctuary city, but also to tie it to the next work that I just want to briefly talk about, um, which is a piece um, about San Francisco um, that. Um, Thanks to Kathy, um, I was asked to make for the San Francisco Arts Commission. Um, and it, it was a work about the status of sanctuary city um, of, um, of our city, San Francisco, um, where I drew parallels between Mecca and, um, um, and San Francisco as you know, both places that have um, this kind of frenzied infrastructure development where um, that kind of development is uh, prioritized over um, human protection or you know, perhaps protection, protecting the environment. Um, and so in, um, uh, uh, just to wrap up quickly, in, in my version of San Francisco, um, you know, you're confronted by a littered datascape, um, which are photographs of um, um, homeless encampments that I photographed under various highways around the Bay Areas. Um, you're also confronted by fog, um, as well as the cranes that we saw in the earlier piece. Um, and in both cities, uh, both versions of um, these cities, um, you know, you're, you're meant to sort of be in this in-between place, in a threshold um, where, um, where, you know, again, in this work, the viewers put in, in a kind of uncomfortable proximity um, to, to these shelters and encampment structures um, that perhaps you wouldn't, um, you know, necessarily confront as you walk around um, San Francisco or drive around San Francisco, I should say. Um, yeah, so, so, you know, I'm, I'm confronting power, as I said, um, by, by creating a situation which perhaps brings the viewer to a kind of understanding about these cities. Yeah, thank you.
Thank you, Asma. It was such a pleasure to work with you uh, on this project with uh, Jackie Francis as well. And um, yeah, it's like I'm still moved by it. Um, can we please hear from Zena next? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, Janet, is this a good moment to uh, maybe play the video? If it's easy, if it's not, it's fine with uh, with with this. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, definitely. Play it. And um, and Kathy, I was thinking a lot about power because it's very complex. Our relationship to it and every on on every level. And um, so uh, I think for me, I don't want to use the word confront. I'm learning through my work as I'm becoming hopefully a more mature artist <laughs> that how to be more effective at um at working with with you know conveying the themes that i'm trying to convey and for me what um when i think about this work you know i got the opportunity to do this work on a symbol of power this the salesforce tower represents sort of i mean it looks like a missile it also looks like the phallus of capitalism so this is already by itself a symbol of power and i got the chance to put my work over there so in a way um, my strategy was to use um, site specificity and timing also because i got the chance to screen this work during september uh, and when you think skyscraper and september you, you can i mean it evokes the events of uh, 9 11 and that automatically brings to mind narratives of war and and all the all the things that are associated with it um, so in a way i learned that using uh the, the timing on what's current at the moment and the site specificity helps a lot in in engaging with power in that sense and also this this tower is like the second tallest tower in the us west of the mississippi river but but most importantly with this work i think what i was trying to do is that you know the idea of extracting these figures from the sumerian tablet um in a way symbolically enacted and embodied um, uh, extracting the figures from their original tablet context and migrating them to a u.s context uh, in which they become exploited laborers in the U.S. capitalist uh, market. So by having these figures, um, Mesopotamian figures, um, in a way, I was hoping to do a reversal because the towers, we should also not forget, are the language of occupation, of uh, control um, and surveillance. Um, in prison systems so um so in that sense by having those figures there there's a reversal and i think that that in a way for me this is how what the strategy that i use for that relying on that um uh, relying on that reversal uh, in other works uh, thank you so much janet for the video if it's uh, possible to jump to the I'll just be very brief to talk about another work. Um, uh, the next slide. Um, uh, this work is called uh, Holy Land, uh, and it's a derivative work from an animation. Uh, animations that also deal with uh, narratives of uh, of war. But here, what I want to point to, I've I've used uh, text. Uh, uh, from the U.S. Department of Defense Law of War Manual. So here, um, I am sort of looking at uh, the laws that regulate uh, wars and how they're abused or not necessarily followed. And, and these, you know, I have uh, images um, of stills that are sort of coming from different animations and I sort of collapse them together. And then the text next to it, it has definitions that are used in war, but they're contested definitions. Um, for example, treatment of detainees or the limitation on the uh, power of the occupying power. And then when we think about 
um, the US policies abroad uh, and how they're enacted or not enacted. And so this is sort of one other way of engaging with this uh, mechanism of power, the law, basically. And when we have states of exception, for example, like after 9-11, uh, there was an act that uh, issued by the Bush administration that allowed uh, stopping, um, you know, questioning anybody who was not white, basically, who, who would be suspected of uh, uh, terrorism, not any, anybody who was not white, but kind of uh, brown people who, um, and in that sense, the laws were not, uh, necessarily followed, um, you know, there was a state of exception. Anyway, I'm going to wrap it up because I <laughs> sort of uh, um, going in different directions. So I, I think that's, uh, that's my answer uh, about that. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you, Zena. Um, so much to say. Maybe we can save um, additional chatting about this uh, challenging and complex uh, topic for the Q&A. Uh, Maya, I would love to hear from you about this as well. Thanks, Kathy. This is a good question because I feel like power is, uh, I don't know, I, I immediately thought about, um, I read the book Letters to a Young Artist by Anna Devere Smith. And um, there's a chapter in it that she says, you know, write this down on a piece of paper and post it in your, in your studio or in your workplace and she said, write this down. It's like, the man has the power, but so do I. And uh, you know, I, I did it and I wrote it down and it was in my studio for a long time. And I'm still like thinking about that and what it means to be an artist and how do I, um, you know, how do we process? I mean, this is like intense stuff. So, and I'm in the, the studio painting. So, you know, how is that? Um, how am I using my power? Um, and so this is a recent painting um, called A Night That Was As Light As Day. And something I've been thinking about a lot um, recently and sort of a new idea is um, this idea of uh, landscape. And, and when I was researching the early colonial photographs um, from the United States when they first uh, colonized the Philippines, which is a lot of the resources that I work from. Um, I was simultaneously looking at the Hudson School, River School of, of Art. So I was invited to do a, a tour at the Olana House, which is Frederick Edwin Church's um, house that he built uh, on the Hudson River. And um, you know, I learned a lot in that, uh, just in terms of thinking about American landscape, in particular American landscape painting. And when at that time, when when those paintings were um, being made and what was going on during that time and this whole, you know, idea of um, domination, uh, natural resources, manifest destiny, and the creation of the science of race and justifying genocide and slavery and, and it all just goes with all this empire um, making. And, um, and I was thinking about the, the, the way that they would use figures in those works as sort of a, just a like when you would put like a pen in a photograph to show how big something is as a, as a tool for scale, um, as well as sort of being bunched into this um, idea that their part, that the landscape is this wilderness to be conquered and, and, and dominated and land is free to take. And, you know, I think um, that's something that is just as in terms of painting in this painting, I was thinking about ways to sort of combat that or I guess confront that idea of the the way that landscapes were depicted. And um, so I, I was really thinking about compositional goals in, in this painting and sort of thinking about eliminating the horizon line and decentralizing the figure, um, creating a non-hierarchical relationship between the figure and landscape. And, um, and so, you know, forms of the bodies echo forms in the, in the natural elements and also thinking about um, ambiguity and, and uh, concealment and, and um, you know, like th that you can't quite see everything at all at once when you look at a, this painting 
Um, so thinking of also about this for folkloric um, research, Philippine folklore that I was learning about too, you know, there's all these sort of rituals, you know, if you were to cross a river, you would have to say something to the spirits or the, to the, what is invisible, what we can't see um, and, and sort of ask permission to, to go to that place. And, and there's just a lot of sort of reverence for what is around us in the natural world that we maybe can't see. And I think growing up in, in our culture, it's like, uh, well, that really idea of land that's meant to be dominated is, is pretty uh, strong. So, so just, um, just trying to think about that. And then also um, in terms of painting itself uh, versus photography, which has been a tool of colonization. And um, because I use, I've used so much uh, archival photography as references, like the, the, it's like the opposite, you know, painting takes a long time. It takes so long for the paint to dry. I don't know where it's going when I'm working with it. Um, and, and it kind of becomes a world of its own and that feels very slow, like it's a very slow burn um, that feels kind of in the face of, you know, progress and just steamrolling um, ahead and trying to push one narrative um, and, and trying to incorporate and putting in, into a painting, you know, a lot of different things at once um, so that there's not one clear or dominant narrative that there's multiplicity and, and multiple possibilities. And I think there's a couple of references of some of these photographs I was talking about. Yeah, like this is a photograph from the Worcester collection from the Newberry Library. And for me as a person who's born in the US, like, oh, I wanna see the Philippines this is where my parent, you know, where my family is from. And I'm looking at these images and like, okay, this is a river. I'm interested in the river, but then it kind of comes to learn like these are all photographs that were taken by governmental officials who, you know, just photographed it for the resource of the land and not for the pit, like for the beauty of it or anything. Like an artist might think, oh, what a beautiful landscape. It's it's all kind of they were used to uh, lure investors to to buy these these lands up because of all their resources and, and just make them rich. And then there's another uh, image. Yeah, this is an example of uh, Thomas Cole, uh, Hudson River School painting that also had the literally westward, like as you go from the right, the right of the painting to the left of the painting, like the left of the painting symbolizes the west and how it's like stormy and wilderness and, you know, at the end of all that, they, they made it to California and then they went all the way to the Philippines. So I'm very interested in that connection. Thank you, Maya. You know, I was also um, thinking about how a lot of these paintings like um, by Thomas Cole and um, others who are depicting the West, often times they were more, um, or, you know, they could probably more accurately be described as fantasies of, of what the landscape looked like, um, you know, fantasies of this um, untouched, unspoiled, pristine landscape. And um, as you were talking about, you know, looking into archival photographs um, as, as a, in the process of learning about your own um, ancestry, I was thinking about Orientalist painting and how in a lot of cases, um, people from West Asia will look at these Orientalist paintings, which, you know, as an academic, we, we're taught that these are, um, you know, uh, exoticized um, fantasies, really European fantasies. Um, Linda Nochlin has, you know, wrote this famously about these fantasies of um, untu uh, cultures untouched by Europeans, and just thinking about like the intersections of like all our desires, you know, from uh, you know my desires and your desires, and how like through the process of painting, um, you know, and and particular, I liked how you emphasize the slowness. Of, of that, how, you know, we, we kind of create these worlds that are um, 
you know, reflections of our, of our worldview perhaps, or, or maybe desires, or maybe a, an act of recovery or, or something along those lines. It's really exciting. Thank you. All right. Oh, I actually, I forgot I have a third question, but I'm not sure if we have enough time um, for the third question because we only have nine minutes left and, and we do have some questions in, um, is it all right with you all if we skip the um, last question? Is it okay? okay why, why don't we, um, yeah. Janet, are you cool? Uh, Moderating? Yeah, so we had some questions come in during the conversation. Thank you all. I feel like we need a, a part two and a part three to this panel here. Um, so I did wanna just ask a few questions in the time that we have here. Um, we had, uh, was the Indian miniature, did Indian miniature painting start during the reign of Jahangir? I think that's for Asma. Um, thanks, Janet. Um, well, I, you know, I should preface this question by, um, or answer by saying that I'm not an art historian. Um, I am an artist, um, but I, I don't believe so. Um, you know, I it just as um, um, any form of painting, Indian miniature painting is informed by things that happened before it in proximity to it. Um, so, you know, what, what I'm referring to in my work um, is um, Islamic miniature painting um, that was um, uh, done uh, for um, and um, uh, uh, commissioned by uh, the Mughals. Um, um, and, um, it, you know, and it was informed by indigenous painting practices that existed in India. Um, from before when the Mughal or Mughals arrived. So um, those include Buddhist uh, painting traditions, um, as well as um, things that were happening around um, um, uh, India, uh, or, or I should say, you know, in Safavid, Iran and beyond. Um, uh, Mughal miniature paintings are also influenced by Western paintings. So the image that we saw of Jahangir with the halo, um, you know that that image, um, the halo is is um, directly influenced by um, Western medieval um, painting form, where the halo depicts um, you know someone who's who's divine and someone who um, is royalty. So um, yeah, so the Mughals were um, you know great connoisseurs uh, of this form of painting, and they um, it, it, you know cultivated. Um, workshops and paid um, artists to uh, develop this practice even more. Um, but uh, th that's not where, um, yeah, that's not the beginning of, of this form. It's informed by, by all of these other things. And this is a question for Zaina. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the fire and snow animations? Uh, yeah, so the fire and there is smoke and gas that you saw in the video, uh, that is also a, a way to reference natural disasters and how capitalism also fuels sort of global warming and so not only war. So that was the reason why I had the fire. So it was uh, playing on that, uh, the global work, warming, the environmental uh, problems that we have today in relation to capitalism and also um, reminding also of the events of uh, September 11. Thanks. And a related question to that, um, Zaina, are you interested, invested in how viewers read the standard of capitalism? Does it decorate the phallus of capitalism or resist against it? Uh, invested, I'm definitely invested with how people read the work because the audience completes um, the, the, the meaning of the work in a way. And uh, I mean, um, yeah, so in that sense, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm definitely uh, invested in that and people can, 
you know they they want to respond to it the way they um they respond to it it's they're going to relate to it the way they relate to it i cannot control that but i can learn from it and that helps me um uh, make my work uh, or uh, use my work more effectively in the next artwork that i make because just going back to Cathy's idea about power, art is also a form of soft power for us to achieve things that we want to highlight, to make visible narratives that are invisible, uh, to raise questions that will help shape the current context. Thank you. Thank you. And for Maya, where does your desire to pen? paint landscape and nature come from? Can you explain what the figures are doing in a night that was as light as day? And what do you want people to take away from viewing this painting? Oh, good question. Um, <laughs> you know, I like that you use the word desire. I, I think like um, I was thinking about that in that last question about power, um, because I think that um, part of the landscape comes from just like I, had shared that photograph of, of that river. Um, I, I've just like, just maybe naively a curiosity about this country that my parents called home that I never lived in. So I had, so it's like, for me, it's a way to see that. Um, and then to, to paint them um, becomes this, that sort of that desire comes into the painting and, um, and I think there's a, sen a sense of sort of like embodiment that happens um, in that process of, of painting where I'm looking at something, let's say an image or uh, a lot of the family photographs are there usually outdoors or in, in the environment. So for me, that's, that's a connection there that I have. And um, in terms of what the figures are doing, um, I, I kind of, would love to leave that up to the viewer. It's uh, with that sort of slow looking at that painting. Um, I think that it's uh, not quite ever really going to be clear what they're doing, and I think that's part of um, this question of uh, opacity and um, you know this sort of desire to feel like as a viewer it should be clear. Or um, but then that there are ways that the painting itself obscures itself like there are figures that are painted over under those layers and it's similarly in the land that like I'm sitting on now like I'm not the only person that's ever lived on this house and I don't know there's a history like there's a history underneath that isn't isn't totally visible so um uh I think that's that's something that I'm thinking about a lot now too is what we can see and what we can't see and what what sort of stays hidden under these layers Um, I'll have I'll just add my own question that came up when listening to all of you. Um, so I've seen just different places show up. So San Francisco, Mecca, Salesforce Tower, Philippines. Um, I'm wondering if there's any kind of link or like how and if you work with um, your own family or your own communities directly when developing your work. And this is for anybody. I can jump in. Um, yeah, I, I'm just gonna say yes. Like that was kind of how I got interested in the work that I'm making today. Um, in, when I, one of my first projects that I did, I recreated my grandparents' living room. They lived in Indiana, in Fort Wayne, Indiana when I was growing up in Chicago. And um, one of the, like that experience of making that room, um, I remember one time I had a critique, this was in grad school and uh, everyone came in and they were like, this looks like my grandma's house. This looks like my grandma's house. And I was like, your grandma was not Filipino. And then I had this like realization that like, wow, they really were very assimilated or, and so it made me ask this question of, well, how much did they want to show where they were from or how much were they able to bring over? And then it sort of sparked this curiosity. Um, and I, I actually feel like my grandmother was my collaborator. Um, throughout and she still is even though she's not here with us anymore. Um, so yeah, I think family has been 
at first was kind of this thing that nobody seemed to care about but me <laughs> especially in prints and stuff like that it's like what what are you making personal work about no one's going to care um but today you know that feels it feels very clear um why that was there and that I feel grateful that I followed it because it continues to unfold and of course the personal always relates to everything else so that's my answer Yeah, I, I can, I, are we out of time? Can I just, okay, I'm just going to quickly I say uh, that I totally agree with Maya that, um, you know, my work too often comes or um, is, is sparked by a really personal experience or uh, a familial history. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the personal sort of becomes a prompt to engage in a kind of open-ended immersive investigation and research and and so sometimes the the personal gets buried um in um in 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 telling uh these larger histories and stories but but it's always the place where things are um started and initiated in in my work uh, thanks asma and for me the same as maya and asma also the personal and the family is always sort of at the source of the work that I'm making. It's either the location that I'm referencing or the history that I'm referencing. And it also, it's always, again, it depends on the audience, who that audience is that is looking at the work. And this relates to the question you asked me before, Janet. Uh, sometimes people will get some references, but not everything. And it's okay because uh, we relate to the artwork, we project often uh, our own experiences into the artwork that we're experiencing. So in that sense, not everything is going to come through, but the source of any, I mean, for me, with any work coming um, that, that I make is definitely the sources where I come from and my experiences growing up and my family and my culture. Thanks. Well, thank you, everyone. You won't, won't go an extra hour, even though I think we can do that easily. Um, I just want to thank you all, um, Kathy, Maya, Asma, and Zaina, for taking the time into our audience. Um, we hope that you will visit the Asian Art Museum and also see the, um, the exhibition After Hope that these dialogues kind of emerged from. Um, so thank you all so much um, for taking your time this afternoon, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Bye. everyone.